Hello, my beautiful friends. I am Laurel Bleeden Maffei with Illuminating Souls, welcoming you to this episode of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings, a podcast designed to help you rest, relax, and fall asleep, all while deepening in your connection with your beautiful team of angels who love you so. So I am an angelic practitioner and a spiritual teacher and an encourager of souls. And I have been a full-time practitioner since 2006. And I have taught many, many classes and supported many, many people on their journey. And it is truly my blessing to be here for you now. So you might wonder what an angelic practitioner does. Well, I offer services. I have one-on-one angel sessions and soul mentoring. And what I'm really known for are my classes. I love to teach and I'm always offering a new class every six weeks or so. And it's always changing. And what's beautiful about this is it allows my classes to evolve and adapt to whatever's happening in life right now keeps it interesting for me and for the participants. Many people who take classes with me have been with me for quite a while, so if you're looking for a sweet community, if you're looking for a way to support yourself, to have a sweet check-in with the angels and with the light once a week, I invite you to learn about my offerings and You can do that through my website, illuminatingsouls.com, where you can sign up for my mailing list. And I want to thank you for listening. This podcast is a broadcast filled with a lot of love for you. And it is an unlikely mashup of two of my favorite forms of self-care, connecting with the angels and listening to a sleep podcast which I do every night. It's something that helps me to build a bridge between my waking consciousness and sleep. For many years, I watched television to do that, but several years ago, I made the switch to sleep podcasts and I've absolutely fallen in love with this genre. There's something about a low murmuring voice speaking gently into my ears, just telling me a story, just rambling about just about anything that helps me to drift off. It's a cozy feeling for me and one that I hope to replicate for you. So each episode is about an hour long And it's that long because that's my preference as a listener. I prefer longer episodes because then I don't feel pressured to fall asleep. I use a sleep timer as well. So if I'm listening to an episode, I will make sure that my sleep timer is set to either turn off when the episode is over or at a certain milestone. So 45 minutes, let's say. And then I just let myself drift off. So each of these episodes is an hour for that reason. Usually the first 15 to 20 minutes is me rambling like I am now and perhaps sharing a spiritual morsel or two with you and bringing in the angels so that you know that they are here. And then the next 40 minutes or so is story time. And story time can be stories from my own life, which is what I have in store for you in this episode. Or we can flip through the pages of an old TV guide or a community cookbook or an old magazine that's in the public domain. So it's not meant to be a riveting hour that that will require your full attention. It is definitely meant to be a companion to you as you are either falling asleep 
or if you are one of our beautiful listeners who listens during your waking hours, it's just also a gentle, soothing companion as you go about your day. So whenever you are listening, thank you for being here. I am grateful for our time together. And I am sending you so much love. So as I record this, it is early morning and I, I don't know what is happening. Um, in, well, I know what's happening in the world. I, I was going to say, I don't know what's happening in the world, but actually I do. <laughs> Not all of it, but I do watch the news. But I was going to say, I don't know what is happening energetically because I have been feeling just a deep sense of fatigue the past week. And it's not a heaviness, it's not ominous. It feels more just like a lot of energy is streaming in. And that's something we're going to talk about in story time, about some of the different ways I have experienced energy before. So so this conversation will be relevant to story time. But I suspect that this fatigue I'm feeling has to do with the energies that are streaming in. And so... I haven't felt up for recording a new episode, so I posted a replay, and then I missed Sunday's episode. I hope you'll forgive me, but now I'm recording this so that I will publish new content for you. So it is early morning, and it's overcast, which I love right now, because it's like a cocoon of coziness. <laughs> so the sky's kind of gray and the leaves are just gently waving in the breeze. And the world is still quiet. I love this time of day. Early morning is actually a wonderful time to record a sleep podcast because I'm still in close proximity to that expansive space that is sleep, wherever our consciousness goes while we are resting our bodies and our minds. This frequency feels very much available as I record this. So I'm going to invite you to get comfortable. If you are preparing for bed, I'm going to invite you to cozy on up and snuggle on in my favorite thing to do at the end of the day is to crawl into bed. I love bedtime. It's just a delicious time of day for me. And I, I love crawling under the covers and curling up with my pillows and putting in my earbuds and picking a podcast to listen to. So get cozy in whatever way works best for you. And I'm going to invite you to just take a few nice deep breaths in and out. And I'm going to call the angels in to be with us. They're already here. But I love sharing this ritual with you so that you know they are here as well. So beautiful angels on high, I invite you to join us here. I ask that you infuse this broadcast with waves of love, upliftment, healing, and goodness in service to each of our beloveds hearing this message. Angels, I ask that you pave their way with grace, that they feel divine love holding them aloft, as they go about their day and as they drift off into their dreams. Angels, I ask that you help to clear from us any old energies that are not ours to carry that no longer serve us. Help us to come into even more of our authentic selves, energizing our authentic path. Knowing that each one of us is a blessing upon this earth. So dear ones, just take some nice deep breaths in and out, just allowing this love to flow to you. 
as it flows to every cell of your body, every thought in your mind, and every emotion in your heart, just allowing the angels of love to meet you where you are. You know, I think sometimes we think we have to somehow raise our vibration and clear our minds in order to connect with divine love. But that's not necessary. Divine love can always meet you where you are. It's like you don't have to transform consciousness to go outside and bathe in the sunshine. The sunshine simply exists. You just have to sometimes move your physical location so that you can be present to it. And so it is with divine love. Sometimes it's just about shifting awareness ever so slightly to recognize that it is here for you. It is in the room. It is where you are. It is here for you. And this is not a love that you have to earn or perform for or become worthy of. It exists. It exists always and forever for you. So this love is both impersonal and very personal because the angels know you. They have known you since before you were born. They know every breath of your life. They know what you have been through. They know the courage it has taken to see you to this moment. They know how deeply you feel. They know what brings you the greatest joy and they know what your deepest challenges are. They understand you and they are deeply appreciative of the opportunity to support you. You know, the relationship with our angels is meant to be subtle, so subtle that most people don't know that it exists. And this is because this is your lifetime. It's your incarnation. So we're not meant to have angels on the phone constantly telling us what to do. This is a realm of free will. And we are always growing and evolving and experiencing life and we're choosing and we're moving along our path. But always there is this love here. And we can always ask the angels for support. So this method of connecting with the angels is meant to bring you into deeper awareness that this love exists. It's not about creating a dependency or always needing to check in. Is this the right decision? Listen, you're, you're pretty smart. You've got a lot of experience under your belt and, and you can trust yourself. You don't always have to outsource guidance. In fact, you rarely, almost never should outsource guidance. It's about connecting with the wisdom of you, the wisdom of your soul, your knowingness. And the angels are here to help you with this. So just take another deep breath in, allowing yourself to breathe deeply, affirming and acknowledging the beauty that is you, the preciousness that is you, the gift that is you. The angels want you to know that you are doing so much better than you know. And also in service to this being a sleep podcast, they also want you to know you have permission to rest. Not that you need their permission. That's a silly idea. But sometimes we just need to be reminded we have permission to rest. As I record this, it's Monday morning, and let me tell you what I did this weekend. Nothing. <laughs> well, that's not true. Saturday morning, I went to Costco, and I did the farmer's market. And after that, I did nothing. 
no thing. I sat on the couch and I just chilled out because I was tired. And I could have mustered up some energy and done something, but why? If the fatigue was with me, why not acquiesce to it and recognize that it was probably there for a reason? And that resting was what was being asked of me. See, resting is not an inert activity. Resting is allowing our bodies and our consciousness and our light bodies to replenish and restore and acclimate. We don't always have to be busy. So take a deep breath in and breathe in the vibration of rest. Restfulness, yes, replenishment. And just breathe, allowing this love to be here with you now. And so my beautiful friend, I invite you to drift off to sleep if that is your intention or if you are in the middle of your waking part of your life. Stay awake, please, especially if you're operating heavy machinery. And we're going to move on into story time. So for story time, I'm going to share with you some randoms from my spiritual journey. And I want to share with you how this story time was inspired because it's a really strange loop-de-loop of consciousness. I'm always fascinated by how our consciousness works or how my consciousness works and how by rambling through thoughts and memories, you know, that inner subtle conversation that takes place when we're not doing anything, how one thing leads to another leads to another. So this particular portal was opened as I was watching the Olympics. So, so right now, as I record this, the Olympics have just started and I'm watching gymnastics and I'm fascinated by gymnastics, just like I'm fascinated by figure skating and skiing and these kinds of athletic sports that require bravery and flexibility and muscle strength and aerobatics that I cannot even conceptualize ever happening in this body of mine. I mean, I have a hard time getting up off the floor. <laughs> like, if I'm down on the floor, it's going to it's going to be an effort to get back up. I can do it, but it's not pretty. And there's Simone Biles is like just as if gravity doesn't apply to her the same way it applies to everyone else, right? It's magical. So, so as I was rambling through this idea, I thought there are many, many, many different kinds of bodies and bodies with many different kinds of abilities. And people with different levels of acceptance of risk and balance and flexibility and endurance. And I think, well, this body of mine loves sitting on the couch and is just flexible enough to get me through my day. And my endurance isn't terrific unless I'm doing angel sessions, in which case plug me in and keep me going. And how on this expansive bell curve that is human beings, how different we all are. So, so that's where my consciousness was going. Like, wow. You know, I look at figure skaters because I've tried to skate. It's not, it's not easy. And, and it is not easy for the, me and this body and my center of gravity and my not so strong ankles 
well, they're strong enough to keep me walking during the day, but not strong enough for skating, which I have not done in at least 45 years, probably. But I'm just saying, right? Like, I watch figure skaters, and I marvel at their athletic ability. How is it possible we are both human beings? Like, th th that's where my mind goes. And so I had this just funny little thought, which I have every once in a while, which is, you know, if I come back for another lifetime, I am going to maybe ask for a more athletic body. And I would also want to ask for a body that can sing gospel music really, really well, and perhaps be on Broadway. Like, I'm going to ask for a different, you know, assemblage of gifts, perhaps. And, and then I thought, well, I don't even know that I want to come back and, and you know, if you believe in reincarnation, which I do, maybe you've had these thoughts too of like, oh, I don't know that I want to do this again, or if I do come back, I want this to be the thing. You know, all of these things our earth people, our earthly consciousness contemplates, which I'm sure has nothing to do with what the whole incarnating thing is really like anyways. But we try to assign meaning to the things that we can't understand right? Our minds are very creative. And so we try to make up story that makes sense. Okay, so here's where we're going to drop in to this spiritual adventure that I had that is going to loop us back to this conversation about would I even come back? Would I even incarnate again? And it's also going to loop back to the conversation about energy. And it's, it's going to bring in a lot of threads. I'm very impressed with my consciousness that it managed to find this opportunity for me to share this story with you. So in 2006, that's when my husband and I got married. We got married in September of 2006. Perhaps I will share with you about the wedding. I don't know that it's going to be in this episode. But where we pick up the story, we are now married. We're, we're early into our marriage by a month or two. And it's 2006, so it's before social media. And the way we would connect or I would connect with community was through Yahoo groups. Yahoo groups was the closest thing we had to social media and online community. So at this point, I am graduated from the University of Santa Monica, where I got my degree in spiritual psychology. And I'm still volunteering there. I'm still living in Los Angeles. And my husband is living in Northern California. And we're commuting back and forth. But I'm still well entrenched in my life in Los Angeles. And Illuminating Souls is nine months old. So at some point, maybe in August or September, I saw someone post in one of the University of Santa Monica alumni Yahoo groups that the Dalai Lama was going to be in Pasadena and was going to do, I think two, I want to say three days of teachings. And there was a Buddhist community in Los Angeles that was doing the ticket distribution and that you could get on the list. And I thought, Oh, well, I want to be on the list for that. I mean, who doesn't want to go to three days of teachings with the Dalai Lama? And so I put my name on the list for four tickets. So one for me, one for my husband, Wes, one for my friend, Judy, and one for my friend, Susan. And I didn't know if we would get the tickets or not, you know, that, it, but, but we did. In addition to the three days, I'm going to call it three days just for the purposes of this podcast. I'm pretty sure it was three days. So in addition to the three days of teachings with the Dalai Lama at this auditorium in Pasadena, he was also going to be doing a talk one evening at Universal City. So at the Universal Amphitheater, which is much, much bigger and can hold thousands of people. And he was going to give a talk for the public which we also bought tickets to. We were going to do the whole thing. So the auditorium that we were in in Pasadena was smaller than the Universal Amphitheater, right? Maybe it held a thousand people, maybe fewer. I'm, I'm not a good judge of size of crowds. 
Here's what was so fascinating to me about this experience. There were a lot of conversations and talks and prayers happening during these teachings, much of which went over my head because I I wasn't a student of Buddhism. You know, I'd read some books and I certainly appreciate Buddhism, but I'm not a student of it. But still, it was filled with so much love and wisdom and light, and I was fascinated and riveted. And whenever the Dalai Lama started teaching, I would get so tired, and I would fall asleep. And this kept happening. I would be awake when other parts of the program were happening. And then when the Dalai Lama started teaching... I couldn't keep my eyes open. And and by the second day of this, I, I, I didn't understand and I was getting annoyed with myself because this is a Dalai Lama and of course I should stay awake. Like this is a, the experience of a lifetime. And I mentioned this to my friend Judy, who I also call Judes. So if you listen to other podcast episodes, that's my friend Judes. And I said to her, I said, what is wrong with me? I can't keep my eyes open whenever he talks. And she said, it's because his energy field is so high that the best way for you to assimilate with it is to go to sleep. So so don't judge it. You're receiving what you need to receive and the best way for this energy field to work with you and be with you is while you're sleeping. And that was the first time I'd heard that before. But it made a lot of sense. Because, you know, when other parts of the program were happening, it's not that they weren't high vibration. But there was a different presence dropping in when the Dalai Lama was teaching. So, this is where it gets back to the reincarnation part. So, part of this teaching was that he was going to be bestowing a ritual upon those who wanted to receive it. I should have asked Wes what it was because I don't remember, but it's the seven drops of something. I, I forget what it is called. And basically, you're taking a vow that says, as long as there is suffering on the earth, I will continue to reincarnate. I mean, it's, talk about a beautiful vow. But also, I mean, suffering is going to be going on for a long time, probably, right? And And me, Earth Girl Laurel, I was like, yeah, I don't think so. (laughs) And and he was very kind. And and this was not the kind of ritual where you had to go up and he would give it to you. It was basically you sat in your seat with everyone else. And he moved everyone through the ritual who wanted to receive it. And he said, you don't have to receive this. Please don't, don't take this on if you're not sure. And so... I was like, you know what, I'm good on an as-needed basis. Like, I'm going to decide at the time that the me that I am here in 2006, sitting in this seat in Pasadena, I do not feel like I have enough information to make the choice to continually reincarnate. Like, I'll decide that on the other side. I'm good with that. (laughs) And my husband, Wes, took took the, um, took the blessing. And I believe my friend Jude did as well. And so afterwards I said to Wes, I said, dude, you just said you'd come back because he always talks how he never wants to come back because most of us that are aware of what this incarnation means are like, yeah, I don't know that I'll do this again. And he's like, well, it doesn't mean I have to come back as a human being. I, I, I said, like, what, a cat? And he says, no, I could come back in spirit. I'm like, listen, I don't know if that's how it works, but God bless you, because I'm not coming back a lot. At least at this point, I don't think I am. And it turned into one of those really funny conversations, which actually doesn't really mean anything, because how could we possibly know in this human iteration what the plan is for future incarnations? But I think it is a beautiful part of the Buddhist journey to vow to come back 
to support this healing, this evolution of the planet. So, so that was the little daisy chain that I made in consciousness from. If I come back again, I want to pick a very beautiful, wonderful, athletic body that can sing gospel and be on Broadway. Um, and then I remembered, oh, isn't that interesting? I remember about that Dalai Lama um, vow and, and how I said, and yeah, no, uh, I'll decide. I'll decide at the time. <laughs> I, I'm not evolved enough to know that I would say yes to that. And how Wes said yes. Because if you talk to Wes now, he, he's like, I'm not coming back. And, and again, this seems like a really weird conversation unless you are somebody who believes in, in, in reincarnation, like we come back. Because most of us who are aware of this concept, most of us are like, yeah, I'm good. No, no thanks. Don't know that I need to come back. <laughs> so, so, so that led me down that rabbit hole and I was remembering the power of that experience. And what's so interesting is, so my fatigue kept happening during the three days of teachings. And then I would wake up as soon as he was done. It doesn't mean I would, I mean, it's not that I was completely unaware when he was teaching. I just meant I would get really like dozy. I would sort of feel, start feeling like I was dozing off. But the, the evening where he was speaking at the Universal Amphitheater, I was wide awake and energized. And I thought, oh, it's because his energy is different right now. He's not, he's not bringing in these beautiful teachings and rituals and, and prayers for everyone. Um, I mean, it's not that he's not, but he's, he's like at a different frequency now. I don't know that this is intent. Like, I don't know him. I don't know that it's intentional, but I thought, oh, we're sort of on a different radio station right now because I was energized and I was alert and I was aware and I was soaking it all in. So that was really my first experience with this concept of sometimes when we're in the higher energies, the best way to let them work with us is by dozing off. So, so I'm going to take that just a little further and then we're going to go back to the Dalai Lama stories because there's more, but, but just, we'll put a pin in that for just a second. So around this time, the secret comes out. For those of you that remember, the secret was a documentary all about the law of attraction and it featured Abraham Hicks was channeled by Esther Hicks. So Esther and Jerry Hicks were a married couple and Esther was the channel for the consciousness of Abraham. So that was my first experience with channeling was through Abraham Hicks. And, and we were all mesmerized by the secret at this point. And so I had purchased a DVD about the journey of Abraham Hicks. And it starts off with I think Wayne Dyer interviewing Jerry and Esther Hicks about their journey with Abraham, with the Abraham consciousness. So while it was Wayne Dyer and Esther and Jerry Hicks, I was wide awake because I'm fascinated by this. I want to hear everything they have to say. This is the most fascinating thing I've ever heard of, this idea that someone can channel this beautiful consciousness. I was mesmerized. And here's where it got so interesting for me. Almost as soon as Esther started channeling Abraham, I fell asleep. So very similar with the Dalai Lama. I had such a hard time staying awake while she was channeling Abraham. And I thought, is it, this is really fascinating. And I would then go on to learn to channel, and I channel my own group, Josephus, and the Wisdom Council, and especially when I used to do in-person angel circles, where there'd be so, tons of energy moving through, people would get sleepy. And Josephus would say, just so you know, if you're feeling sleepy, it's not because we're boring. <laughs> he said, 
It's because the energy is very high here and you are getting cleared and you are getting attuned. And so if you're ever moving through a guided meditation or an energetic healing and you feel very sleepy all of a sudden, don't resist it because it is the best way for you to acclimate and receive the energies that are coming in for you. So, so, so those were like my first experiences in understanding how this energy works. And that's why at the beginning of the podcast, I was sort of hedging about this fatigue I was feeling this weekend and the energies that are coming in because it reminds me of these energetic downloads that happen sometimes. It doesn't mean that fatigue is always because of energetic downloads. I do not want you to make that association. But every once in a while, it is because of that. And that's almost how this has been feeling to me the past few days. So we'll see. I don't know for sure. But I want to loop back around to another very profound experience I had during the three days of teachings with the Dalai Lama. So across the street from the auditorium where this was being held was a Gelson's, which is a supermarket in the L.A. area. A lovely supermarket, by the way. So during our lunch break, we would migrate over to Gelson's and probably some of the other cafes that were in the area to get lunch because we didn't have a long time. So on one of the days, as we get ready to go out for lunch, there is a group of protesters across the street holding up signs that say, repent, accept Christ as your savior, repent. So they are protesting the Dalai Lama and trying to assert that their form of Christianity is the only real religion. And I'm livid. Definitely not a Buddhist response. I'm livid. But then I watched all the the Buddhist monks just walking past them. And not, not walking past them and ignoring them, walking past them in their full presence of their beingness. Like we live in a world where all of this exists. It all exists. And the acceptance that it all exists versus I was very much in they are wrong and and they should be told they're wrong and how I was primed for battle. And, And talk about an interesting contrast. So I got to witness what that is to walk in the beingness through all that is. So that was profound awareness number two is, and this is going to be an interesting thing for me to say as somebody who's raised Jewish and does not in any way identify as Christian. But in my spiritual journey, I've had some very extraordinary experiences with Jesus and Mother Mary and Mary Magdalene, not from a religious perspective, but as as master teachers, as avatars, as healers, as guides, and the love that emanates through them is unmistakable. And that no one who experiences this profound expansiveness of love would ever hold up a sign like that, especially outside of an event that is filled with so much love. And, and I all of a sudden thought, oh, oh, they don't, they don't feel that love in them. Like they're trying to connect with Jesus from this place of a fear-based teaching. They haven't felt it in their heart chakra, because if they did, they would know that if Jesus was actually incarnated upon this earth, he would have been in the room with us. Like, that's that kind of light. It doesn't matter what portal of religion you use to get there or what portal of philosophy you use to get there. It exists, and there are many portals to it. 
but it's unmistakable when you are in the presence of it. And they were definitely not in the presence of it. And, and so as a spiritual teacher, that was a really powerful moment because there's an adage that I believe originated with Abraham Hicks, and I don't know that they actually said this or if I've just now expanded it, but it's this, that a messenger can only deliver a message to someone who's a vibrational match for the message. And that group of protesters were not a vibrational match to the messages that the Dalai Lama was bringing forth. Sad for them, right? Well, I don't know that it's right. It just is. In my perception, it's sad for them. Because they're missing out on this profoundly expansive, life-affirming experience. But, but who am I to say that that's wrong? So again, there, there was a whole like cosmic awareness coming in for me in those five minutes of seeing those protesters and seeing the Buddhist monks walk past them and, and going through my range of emotions and thought forms and having been in this very ascended presence and energy field and feeling how everything was shifting inside of me and rejiggering, coalescing differently so that I would have greater compassion and understanding of how complicated this journey is. And so, so, so that, so that was that piece of it, the, the Dalai Lama piece. And I want to use this now to share with you one of the most profound teachings I received from Josephus and the Wisdom Council, which is the group of angels and guides that I channel. And this has completely shifted how I contemplate these things, and, and I'm hoping it will help you. So I used to do angel circles in Santa Monica once a week, and maybe every other week, and my friend Janice hosted them in her apartment, and I would have to drive from my office in Hollywood all the way down to Santa Monica for the angel circles, which is a long drive with a lot of traffic. So I had a lot of time to contemplate and think. And on this one evening, and I remember, I think I was driving through Beverly Hills or something, or maybe I'd gotten through Beverly Hills because I can still see the neighborhood in my mind when this happened. I asked Josephus, what are we, what are you going to teach tonight? Which was an odd question because basically people would ask questions and then they would answer. So, but for some reason I thought, would you give me a preview of what you're going to be teaching about? And they said, we're going to be teaching about the evolution of God consciousness and human consciousness through the chakras. And then they started teaching me and it is fascinating. So I'm going to assume you have some understanding about chakras, but they're energy centers. And the root chakra is the first chakra, and it has a lot to do with survival. So I have food, I have shelter, I can survive. So it's very survival based. The second chakra is the male female energy, you know, divine feminine, divine male energies and third chakra, see this is where it's going to get important, third chakra is the center of personal power. It's right in the middle of the torso. And evolved third chakra is authentic empowerment, whereas unevolved third chakra is me, mine, my way, or the highway. I am better than you kind of polarity. Then we come up to the heart chakra, which is all based in love. And then the throat chakra, which is voice and third eye, which is seeing and then crown chakra, which is God connection. So that's your crash course taught to you badly by me. <laughs> and if you teach about the chakras, and I've just done a terrible job, I know, but it'll serve for our purposes here. So Josephus starts walking through the chakras and they said, you can tell where someone is evolved to in their own consciousness regarding God 
based on their belief systems. So they said, right now, humanity, most of humanity is stuck in third chakra God consciousness. Third chakra God consciousness says, I'm right, you're wrong. My religion is the right way. Every other religion is the wrong way. If you don't believe what I believe, you are going to get punished. And I must eliminate you. And like all of these really violent things that come with third chakra God consciousness, because third chakra God consciousness believes that God will smote you. That there's the cosmic sorting hat, like from Harry Potter. You've been very, very good and you've been very, very bad. So third chakra God consciousness assigns third chakra belief systems to God. And so there's a lot of fear. And so the people that I saw outside of the Pasadena auditorium protesting the Dalai Lama, they were firmly entrenched in third chakra God consciousness. Repent. This is the only way forward. They then went on to say that those of us who are working on the evolution of consciousness are doing our best to come into a fourth chakra God consciousness. And a fourth chakra God consciousness is based in divine love. God is love. And this love has no polarity. It exists. And love is love. And to understand that even though they're talking about God consciousness, they're really talking about consciousness. Because someone can be an atheist and still have fourth chakra divine love consciousness, even though they won't call it divine. They'll call it service, love, empathy, humanity. See, what we call things doesn't matter. It's the vibration of love that matters. So people get so caught up in religion, rightness, wrongness, smoting, and all of this other stuff. Someone can absolutely not believe in God and be a dyed-in-the-wool atheist and still live a life based in their service to humanity and to the planet, based in deep love and generosity of spirit and kindness and goodness, and they're dwelling in fourth chakra consciousness. So it, 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 we put the word God consciousness in that, but don't let that trip you up, that there has to be a relationship with what is defined as a deity. It is better defined as universal consciousness. That I am, I am a drop of the ocean in the ocean. And I'm going to do my best to bring peace, love, goodness, support to other drops of the ocean. So they're teaching me this as I'm driving to Santa Monica. And it's incredible because I've never heard this before. And then they're also going through, you know, throat chakra God consciousness means I can speak of God and I can speak to God and God can speak to me. You know, whereas we think of people as nuts who go, well, God told me, you know, you get the weird funky music in a documentary when someone says that third eye, I see God. I see, I see beyond this physical world reality. And then certainly crown chakra is I am in relationship with God. I am God. God is me. I am the breath of God that has incarnated as me, not I am God in terms of a narcissistic expression, but it's I am the drop of the ocean and I am the ocean. I am the breath of God incarnated as me, and so I am of God. I'm not the totality of God, right? It's like I'm not, I'm, I'm a drop of the ocean, which means I am the ocean, but I'm not really the totality of the ocean. I know this is getting a little cosmic, but bear with me. So the thing is, is once you come into heart chakra consciousness, it's really hard to, to drop out of it. 
it, it, I mean, we do drop out of it because we're human beings and we're not perfect. But it's easy to see the contrast. And for me, what is maddening to me, so, so if I'm maddened by something, definitely not in heart chakra consciousness, right? It's not compatible with that. So this is me dropping back into third chakra consciousness, which I will admit that when I see people who are preaching what they think is divine love and it is not divine love and I can feel the hypocrisy of it I go into that place that I went into when I saw the protesters outside of the Dalai Lama's event which again, not heart chakra third chakra so even though I endeavor to live my life from heart chakra consciousness as the angels remind me lovingly that I have not incarnated to be an avatar in this lifetime. So it's unrealistic to think that I would always be able to maintain it, but I do my best to dwell from the place of heart chakra consciousness. I'm not perfect at it, but it's one of the reasons I continue to do this work because it's an aspiration. Yes. So one of the interesting things they said is that the incarnation known as Jesus was one who had evolved through all of the chakras of God consciousness. And his lifetime was to show us what that would look like. And there are always beings incarnated on this planet who are embodying that level of God consciousness. It's not unique to, to his earthly incarnation that there are always those who embody this consciousness, but they do not live lives of fame. They live ordinary, seemingly ordinary lives, but they are helping to hold this divine blueprint for the evolution of humanity. Isn't that a beautiful thought? So, so all of this is getting downloaded to me as I'm driving to Santa Monica. And I called Wes because he was in Northern California. I'm like, oh my God, Wes, they're telling me about the evolution of consciousness through the chakras and how most of humanity is stuck in third chakra God consciousness and how many of us are trying to come into fourth chakra God consciousness and why third chakra God consciousness feels so contrary and I have loved that teaching ever since because so much about it makes sense to me. A good teaching, from my perspective, helps me make sense of that which is confusing. So, I endeavor to live in fourth chakra consciousness. I often drop into third chakra consciousness, but I know the difference. And I think that's really powerful to be able to perceive the difference. So I know when I'm in the polarity. I know when I'm in the I'm right and you're wrong energy. Listen, often it can feel very virtuous, right? It's like, I am so right and you are so wrong. It, it feels good in a weird way, doesn't it? <laughs> or maybe just to me. No, I know that it's a universal experience. So I remind myself of that beautiful presence the Buddhist monks had as they were walking past the protesters. It simply exists. I'm going to share one more story about removing your energy from those things. So at some point I had an internet radio show on blog talk radio. That was what it was called. And I would channel, you could probably still find it somewhere. And at some point I was invited onto somebody else's radio show and she had an audience that was more skeptical than my audience was. So there would be a chat room where people would type their chats as well as could call in with questions. 
So one woman comes into the chat and she is so skeptical and so outraged at what we're doing. And she says, if you are real, you can tell me my mother's name. And I said, well, that is not what we do. That is not why we're here. It is not the gift that we bring. And so at some point we invited her to call into the show and she did. And I'm channeling at this point, Josephus is in. And she's going off about how horrible this was. And, and they said, may we respond? And she said, yes. And they would start to talk and she would talk over them. And they said, with really no anger, they said, are, are you here to have a conversation or do you just want to be heard? She says, I want to have a conversation. And they said, well, our understanding about a conversation is you speak and we listen. And then we speak and you listen. Is that agreeable? These aren't their exact words, but this is in essence what they were saying. And she said, yes. And she spoke and they, they listened. And then when they went to speak again, she interrupted them. And they said, thank you. We are complete here. And they pulled their energy back. They weren't punishing her. They just pulled their energy back. And, and when I asked them about that, they said it's because we were not needed there. We were not needed. She, she, she did not want our energy or what we had to share. And so we are not here to convince anybody of anything or, or make them change their perspective. We are here to converse. And that was not what she wanted. And so we pulled our energy back. And the, the reason I share this with you is it was so pure and clean and filled with love. It wasn't like a human reaction of like, if you're not going to listen to me, then I'm out of here. Like there was none of that. It was just, well, we're complete here. And they pulled their energy back. And I was shocked at the power of that. And they didn't pull their energy back from me as the channel. It's not like they went back to wherever they go. And I was just ambushed. They just pulled their energy back from her in that conversation because they were not needed. That this is all based in free will and desire and request. And so they just very gently pulled their energy back. I'll never forget what that felt like. I learned so much from that experience. Because they weren't here to make her wrong or convince her or because that's not what she was in the room for. That wasn't her desire. And so they just pulled their energy back. I just thought that was fascinating. So, so the whole, all that's going on in the world, there is this invitation to sometimes pull our energy back so that we can rebalance and replenish and find our way and come into these brighter energy fields, right? So it's not a mistake that I bring the angels in and try to put you to sleep then because sleeping is one of the best ways to bring in this beautiful angelic energy. So that's the whole thread of some of my interesting spiritual experiences. And, and how they've all sort of woven together for me to give me an understanding of navigating at least my own consciousness when it comes to these spiritual principles we seek to embody. It's not just you learn them once and you're done. As my teacher Mary Hulnick has said, it's one thing to learn a spiritual principle but it can take a lifetime or a lifetimes to learn to embody it. So just because I've learned about the evolution of consciousness through the chakras doesn't mean fantastic. I'm enlightened. I'm done. No way. I am still very, very human and I can easily get stuck in third chakra consciousness 
all the time. But at least I know the difference. I know when to take a breath and try to shift or ask for help from the angels in shifting to heart chakra consciousness. Because if I'm willing to shift the right and wrongness, the polarity of an experience into heart chakra energy, it allows me to be somewhat liberated, to have altitude, and to feel more resourceful in finding my way through an experience. So, take a nice breath in with me. That is the beautiful present I give you in this episode. It's been a lot, I know, and maybe this is one of the episodes you don't want to sleep through because there's a lot of good stuff in here and I hope it supports you. So again, I think every religion, every spiritual path has the capacity to support us in fourth chakra, God consciousness, right? It's not about the right or wrongness. But whenever we meet somebody who is embodying fourth chakra God consciousness, or leave the word God out of it, fourth chakra consciousness, we know the difference. We know what that feels like. When someone meets us in a place of generosity, of compassion, of love, of acceptance, we know what that is. And so here's to endeavoring to embody more of that, please. I mean that for myself. I'm not telling you what to do. I mean, please, more of that, please, for me. May I embody more of this. May I experience more of this, please. So, take a nice, beautiful, deep cleansing breath in and release. And know that you are loved. Hopefully you'll have a deeper understanding of what I mean by that now. So, my beautiful friends, I'm going to bring this episode to an end for now. But the line of energy and the love will remain with you. So, I wish you the sweetest of dreams. I wish you blessings of love. And I look forward to connecting with you again soon. Thank you. I love you.